Hey, Harvest Homes, I hope you guys are doing great. Um, I want to share a thank you card that uh, we received from Conway Christian School. A couple weeks ago during their orientation, we provided for them a lunch and had some of our Harvest Home leaders come and serve the, the faculty and the staff at Conway Christian. It's always great to share these types of things with you guys, just to let you know what kind of impact you guys are having just by supporting Harvest Church, by giving generously to Harvest Church, because when you do that, we're able to go and serve our community and we're in our community for our community. So here's what it says. It says, uh, Dear Harvest Church, thank you very much for the delicious lunch you provided for our faculty and staff during orientation week. You all are such a blessing to the CCS family and your uh, outpouring of thoughtfulness um, and time uh, that you have shown and helping our staff is getting us off to a great start this school year. Uh, thank you again for showing his love through all of you. Uh, blessings Conway Christian School. And so thank you so much for just being so generous and giving of your time, giving of your, your treasures and, and just supporting Harvest Church because the more we have have that support, the more we can do and the more we can share the love of Christ with others. And so today I wanted to share a message. This is going to be um, our message for Labor Day weekend and uh, certainly hope you guys have had a great Labor Day weekend. And I really want to just, before we get into our first series, uh, Taboo, Championing the Untouchables on our launch day, I just kind of wanted to, to pause for a moment and share a little bit more about um, some philosophy of ministry, uh, why I believe the way, way I believe, where I was taught that, and, and what it means for Harvest Church and how we are going to handle some things. And so I think this will be really, really great for you to understand a little bit more of the philosophy behind Harvest Church. While we want to be simple because simplicity scales, complexity crashes, and just to the overall thought process behind um, developing leaders, discipleship, mission, and, and all of those things. Um, when I was in college, I went to North Point Community Church for a while. North Point, you, you've probably heard of them. You've seen them. It's a massive, massive church led by Andy Stanley. For those of you who know Charles Stanley, that's his son. And, and I mean, North Point had everything. I mean, the, the big band, the lights, the screens, super cool environment, great preaching, great kid stuff everything, right? Um, and, I, and I went there and I, I loved it. It was, it was very different than what I'd grown up in. Uh, it, it changed some of the ways that I thought about church and, and church philosophy and, and how to, to make a church that reaches un, for unreached people and reaches unreached people. And, and it really was instrumental. But where I really began to grow, and I, and I think as I've been reflecting on this church planning experience and where a lot of my philosophy began to be birthed around ministry happened at a smaller church, a church that you've probably never heard of before and a pastor that you've never heard of before called 1027 Church and Pastor Tim Wolf. Uh, one of my good friends, Cameron, who's a pastor in Athens, Georgia now, uh, was a good friend of mine in college. And he said, hey, why don't you come to our small group? And uh, I began to go to their small group in East Atlanta. And then I started going and attending 1027 Church. It was a really, really small church plant, probably about 50 people. Uh, met in a high school auditorium and uh, served some coffee beforehand, went in. And, and look, they didn't have the screens. Uh, the, the worship wasn't always awesome. <laughs> the speakers didn't always work. Um, the preaching wasn't the best that you've ever heard in your life. Uh, the the ambiance wasn't either, but uh, it was a small church plant and it was was a church plant that had the vision to plant other churches. And I began to get involved with 1027 and it taught me a few lessons that I have carried with me today and that I want to share with you. And, and some of these lessons um, are lessons that I learned while I was at 1027 church. And some of these lessons I'm going to share with you how I learned them uh, at 1027 church. And uh, here's three of them. Um, sending capacity, Trump seating capacity capacity. Faithfulness precedes promotion and mission drives priorities. Um, so I, I learned those in, in, in my mid 20, early to mid 20s, um, began to learn those principles through various circumstances at 1027 Church. And as I reflect back, those are principles that have really shaped kind of the philosophy of ministry that I've had while I've been a senior pastor. You know, you, you think about what's happened in your past and who you've learned from, and oftentimes that shapes how you live your life. And so a lot of the things that Pastor Tim taught us uh, showed us and allowed us to be involved 
involved in it is are things that I have carried with me. Um, my kids love a simple recipe. Okay, and, and here are the three ingredients. Noodles, butter, Parmesan cheese. So you've got your carb, you've got your butter, and you've got cheese. And what we love to do, and what our kids love to do is, is get the noodles nice and hot, put the butter in the bottom of the bowl, put the noodles on top, sprinkle as much Parmesan cheese you can have, and then just mix it all together and eat it. I mean, it's so simple. But it combines three ingredients that are pretty much essential, right? So you have your carbs, you have your butter, and you have your cheese, and it is a phenomenal meal. Very simple. You don't need some special recipe. You don't need to go out and find some special uh, you know, sauce. You don't have to go out and, and get some herb or something like that. No, 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 no. It, it's simple noodles, butter, and cheese. And put that together, it makes a very powerful combination, and it's delicious. Delicious. When we read the book of Acts, I would say that Acts shares with us a very simple recipe when it comes to church, especially the first century church. And here's why I think that this type of church and what they did in the book of Acts is so important. The book of Acts shares the story of the initial apostles who were planting churches, starting churches, and doing ministry. The people who are closest to Jesus began to operate and carry out what Jesus had taught them and shared with them. And you begin to see that happening in the book of Acts. And so I would even say that what they did and how they did it in a lot of respects is more important than what it's, the church has looked like over the last 50 years to 100 years because they were the people that were closest to Jesus, heard his heart more, spent three years with him, saw how he did ministry. And then, of course, we see what they did in the book of Acts. And so in very similar to that simple recipe, noodles, butter, and cheese, in the book of Acts, I believe you see a very simple recipe for what the church is to look like. And it's simply this. It's preach, equip, plant, repeat. Preach, equip, plant, repeat. You saw the, pe the, the, the apostles in the book of Acts preach. You saw um, Paul preach. Then you saw them equip others. They begin to raise up others. You see Paul with Timothy and Titus. You see Peter raising up people. You see the apostles raising up the apostle Paul. And then they would go around from place to place, from city to city, to the ends of the earth, and they would begin to raise up elders, raise up leaders, and plant local churches. This is what you see. So preach, equip, plant, and repeat. And so when I combine that look into the book of Acts with what I was taught by Pastor Tim in 1027 Church, it helps me combine those two things to kind of begin to develop the philosophy of ministry. And at the end of this message, I'm going to share with you how I've applied that and seen the results. And so I first want to share this. Sending capacity trumps seating capacity. It's so one of the principles I learned. And here's the thing. Ephesians 4 says this about the gifts to the church, Jesus giving these gifts. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the works of, mil uh, of ministry for building up the body of Christ. So one of the things that Jesus has given to the church are several gifts, and those gifts are used to actually build up the body of Christ and to equip the saints for the works of ministry. That's it. So whether it might be apostles or prophets and evangelists, shepherds and teachers, right? Apostles, uh, not big A apostles, like, you know, where you can change Scripture and just, thus saith the Lord, but maybe little A apostles that can start new things, birth new ministries. You've, you've got prophets who... Um, can really have great insight into uh, what the Word of the Lord is saying and what God is speaking. Um, evangelists, people who just have that natural gift to share the gospel, like you hear them sharing it, their heart is to share the gospel, and they just do it really well. And that doesn't give us an excuse if we don't have evangelism to not share the gospel, but there are just some folks out there that Jesus has given to the church that can just do it really, really well. And then they have the shepherds, right? 
we have people who are just natural shepherds. They want to care for people. They want to love on people. They want to take care of people. And so guess what? They build up the body and they equip the rest of the saints for the works of ministry. They show us how to do it. And then we have the teachers, the teachers, the preachers, however you want to say it, that can teach us God's word and they can build up the body and they can equip the saints for the works of ministry. And so that's it to equip the saints so that the body is joined together, the body is unified and it goes out on mission. So when we talk about preaching and we talk about the book of Acts, one of the things is, is that preaching is designed to spur on action. Teaching is designed to encourage us to action, not just to hear something that we like, not just to say an amen, but it is to drive us toward action. When we see in the, in the book of Acts preaching done, it's to take the people listening and get them up off their seats and do action, right? It's the ascending capacity, not the seating capacity, not to just sit around and listen to a preacher because we like him. It's to spur us on to carry out the mission that God has given us and to use our gifts to advance the ministry. Therefore, preaching, therefore, should call to sin instead of desire to seat. So, Preaching should be a call for the desire to send, not the desire to see, not the desire to see how many people I can come and gather to hear me, but to send, right? Um, Tim would preach at 1027 in a way that would compel us to follow the call of God on our lives. Um, he spent time with three college kids. The three college kids were myself, my friend Cameron, and then another gentleman, and I can't really remember his name at this time because he and I have lost touch. But what I know about the three of us is that we had a desire to preach. We had a desire to do ministry. And Tim would teach us and equip us in a way to prepare us to move in ministry. And you know what? All three of us ended up becoming pastors of churches, church planters, church revitalization, just pastors or whatnot. Because Tim took us with the intention not to gather us with him, right? Not to keep us with him, but he desired to teach and equip us to preach in a way that he could then send us. Because Tim taught me one thing is that a church's health is determined more by its sending capacity than its seating capacity. There's a lot of churches that have a lot of uh, rooms, a lot of space to sit, and they, they will come and gather and listen to a preacher and what that. And you know what? That's great. But for me and my philosophy and my heart, I want people to be sent. I want to preach and teach and equip in a way that we are raising up future leaders, raising up future planters, raising up future plant teams so that we can send people to other places to plant churches. We can send people to the nations and watch them go and, and follow the call of God on our life. And so one of the things that really, really grabbed me and my time at 1027 was this, was that sending capacity trumped seeding capacity. And it drove home this simple equation in the book of Acts. We preach, equip, plant, and repeat. So not only does sending capacity trump seeding capacity, but faithfulness precedes promotion. Faithfulness precedes promotion. It's the equipping part. Um... I want to read through two passages of Scripture and then kind of connect them. Exodus 33, 11 says this, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Mer Moses turned, uh, returned to the camp, his assistant, Joshua of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Meaning when Moses would finish up his time, with God, he would go back, but there was one person that would stay there. One person that would stay at the tent, hoping to hear from God, being faithful to hear from God, and it was Joshua. One of the things we read about Joshua is this, is that Joshua supported Moses' vision wholeheartedly. And I believe it's exactly why God chose Joshua to take over Moses' place as leader of the people of Israel when Moses died. 
Because faithfulness precedes promotion. Faithfulness, this ability to champion somebody else's vision, to champion somebody else's heart, and then until you are raised up to go and do it yourself, I would call it the Moses Joshua principle. But it's not just found in that story. If we read in Luke 16, 10 through 12, it says something like this. It says, One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in what which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Faithful with a little and trusted with much. It's just a principle, right? That uh, It's the principle that faithfulness precedes promotion. I've been in a lot of churches. And I've seen people that make a lot of money, people who've sat on boards, people who've been successful. They are the ones that are given leadership. The, the people that have just been around the longest. Just by the nature of you being around for 75 years, you get to lead this or you get to lead that. And what I truly believe is that the way that we choose the people who, we, who lead is through their faithfulness because that's the thing that precedes promotion. It's what you saw with Joshua. It's what we read in the book of Luke. I mean, you've got to be faithful with some things. I remember uh, with Pastor Tim, he taught us this principle uh, that you have to be faithful with the little. The first assignment he ever gave us when the three of us, me, my friend Cameron, and this other guy uh, were with him, we said, hey, we want to preach. We want to be pastors. He said, all right, great, man. I, I'm all for that. Why don't you do that? But first... I need you to go to a Starbucks in this area and Cameron, you're going to go to a Starbucks in this area and you're going to go to a Starbucks in this area. And I need you to just sit there for eight hours and take notes about all the people that come in. What kind of car do they drive? What are they wearing? Do they have dogs, kids, whatever? And we're like, uh, okay. Okay, cool. So we did it and we took them back to our report. We'd sat there for all day and we could study a little bit and do all that kind of stuff for college. But that's what our assignment was. And we're like, okay, we're ready to preach. When are we going to get that series? When are we going to get to preach that sermon that you promised us? He said, you're not because what you're going to do is you're going to go back and do the exact same thing another time. And we said, okay, great. And then we said, okay, we brought it back. We said, all right, when are we going to get to preach? He said, you're not going to get to preach because you're in charge of setting up coffee this week. Okay, and you're in charge of getting uh, and unloading the trailer. Okay, and uh, you're in charge of leading the life group this week. Okay, and so we went and did that. And when are you, when are we ready to preach? And he said, oh, you're not because you're going to do this this week and this this week. And he did this forever and ever and ever. And finally, he said, guess what you get to do? And we said, what? You get to lead communion. Awesome. And once we led communion a couple times really well, then he said, guess what you get to do? What? Now you get to preach. But he taught, taught us this idea that, that faithfulness precedes promotion. Right? That Because a skill, right? It, it, it's just a skill. Competency is just a skill. But faithfulness is a heart. Faithfulness is shown in the heart. Competency is just shown through skill. And what Jesus is after and what Pastor Tim was after was after the heart. Because if you can't be faithful with a little, if you can't be faithful with a little thing, you're not going to be faithful with much. And so we talk about equipping, right? Preach, equip, and plant. I want people who are faithful with a little. People who are faithful with a little. You know, one of the things that, that um, our, my mentors and, and all that say is that when you plant a church, you don't raise up elders really quickly. you got to wait a couple years to see who you got. Because a lot of people will say they are this or they're that, but when you give them some power, then you'll find out who they are. But you'll find out who they are by their faithfulness with little things over two years because then you can trust them with more of the pie. You know, when we talk about equipping and we talk about discipleship, we have... Um, intentionally put together uh, kind of markers for growth. Now, I, I want to share them with you. But first, before we do that, I want to share with you barriers. The first barrier that we have in America to true discipleship, multiplication discipleship, is availability. Nobody has it. Most of our lives, we have zero margin. Uh, we're running kids to sports five days a week, and that's just one kid. Then we have two kids, and they've got something five days a week. And we just, we just don't have any margin. 
uh, we, we're workaholics. We don't have any margin. We got to get to work at 6.30 in the morning so that we can make the, you know, money or, or we got this vacation planned or whatever. So we don't have time to meet for people with discipleship and whatnot. And so one of the barriers to it is availability. We just don't carve out margin for it. Let's just be honest. Second is accountability. Nobody wants it. We're Americans. We pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We have freedom. We don't want anybody to hold us accountable. Are you kidding me? Somebody actually come to me and say, hey, you're actually out of line there. I need you to repent. Oh, oh my gosh, who are you? Who do you think you are? I mean, da, da, da. we don't want that. But that's not biblical. Biblically, we are accountable, right? And applicability. No one does it. We like to read scripture. We like to read books. We like to listen to sermons. But nobody does it. There's three barriers that we have to break through to get to what I feel like is the meat. And we have carved these behaviors out to talk about growth because people will say, well, I'm not growing, so I need, a, I need a Bible study to help me grow. Well, here's how we would determine growing because our mission is so that all people may know Jesus and grow with Him. So growth begins at salvation. Growth begins at salvation. It begins... When someone receives Christ, and then it's followed up with baptism. It's followed up with saying, Jesus taught, said, hey, be baptized. He gave us that example. So now, guess what? We're going to baptize someone. Next, it's serving. I believe that the best way for someone to grow in their uh, personal walk with Christ is through serving. It's the best way to do it. And it's the thing that we've commanded. We've actually put it before getting into a group. The fourth way that we will know someone is growing is if they're giving. You may not be able to afford 10% in your tithe, but maybe you start with 3% or 4% or 5%. You may not be able to serve every single weekend in kids or in greeting, but maybe you do one out of four and then all of a sudden it becomes two out of four or all of a sudden, right? Serving. The other that we believe it's important to live in community. We believe it's important to be a part of a group. So whether that's a harvest home or pretty soon this fall, we'll launch into some discipleship groups. But we want to see people move to a group. And then finally, uh, multiplication. Multiplication is huge. I believe that the uh, number one marker of a spiritually mature person is someone who is multiplying themselves. They are intentional in finding someone to take over for who they are and what they're doing. And so when we talk about equipping and we talk about growing, I'm going to ask the question, well, you don't feel like you're growing? Well, are you serving? Well, no. Well, that's the next step. Well, are, are you in a group? Well, no. I think that's the next step. Well, are you uh, in a group to multiply? Well, no. Are you leading anybody? Well, no. It doesn't have anything to do with if we're in a Bible study or not. It has something to do with how are you applying the thing that is teaching. It's equipping. Because when we read the book of Acts, it's just like, it's just like noodles, butter, and cheese. It's preaching, it's equipping, and then the next thing they would do is getting to planting. And this is what we see, mission drives priorities. Mission drives priorities. When you read the priorities in the New Testament, I want to just give you some scripture references. The first is go. It's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go, Jesus said. Be my witnesses. That's Acts 1, 8. Jesus said, hey, you're going to be my witnesses. Make disciples, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And plant churches. You can read that in the book of Acts, Acts 1 through 28. When you look at the blueprint in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, what you see is this idea of go, be witnesses, make disciples, plant churches. It's this idea of planting. Right? It's this idea of going and launching. You know, 1027 wasn't huge, about 50 people. But their purpose was to plant churches all over the city of Atlanta. And by the time I left 1027 Church to go to Atlanta, that 50-person church had launched two church plants in the city. They didn't wait. They didn't wait to get to 150 to 200 or whatever. No, that was their DNA, right? That's what they wanted to do. That's Tim Wolf's passion. So guess what? They began to launch churches. And I, I don't know if any of those churches are there today. And Pastor Tim, he's living in Miami with his wife, working, I think, for the North American Mission Board at this point. But the point was this, is that the mission drives the priorities. And that the mission was to plant, was to send, was to create new churches in areas that will reach unreached people. 
And so it's the process. It's a simple process. It's to preach. It's to equip. It's to plant. And it's to repeat. Keep doing it over and over and over. You know, somebody asked me early on, what's the success of Harvest Church? What, what would that look like? And I said to me, the success would be that we would be able to look back and say, these are all the leaders that we've raised up. These are the missionaries we've sent out, and these are the plants that we have sent out. It has nothing to do with how many people we have in the church. It has nothing to do with how big our budget is. It has everything to do with preach, equip, plant, and repeat. To raise up leaders after leaders after leaders, which is why we have a leadership pipeline. We want to intentionally show people how they can grow with Jesus through that pipeline. It's why we've laid out these behaviors. We want to be able to track how people are growing from one year to the next so we know, are we actually doing what we need to be doing? That's my heart. That's my heart. To raise up leaders, to preach the gospel, to plant churches, and to see people come to know Jesus and to see communities change because we planted a church in those cities and they didn't happen before. That's it. That's the heart. In Colorado, I started with nine people with the discipleship model from the Timothy Initiative. Timothy Initiative. It's obedience-based discipleship. And those nine people, I told them, I said, here's the deal. If you go through and you do these exercises and you find someone to disciple and you do that, you can move on to the next session. But if you don't, we're, we're, not, we're not moving on. And I remember taking those nine people, and those nine people quickly became eight because that one person couldn't do it. And we got through um, all of uh, Timothy Initiative Book 1, which is about nine sessions. And in that, we took people to share the gospel. I remember one night they gathered. I said, hey, guess what we're doing tonight? We're breaking up into teams, and we're going to the grocery store, and we're sharing the gospel cold turkey. I'll show you how to do it. This person is going to lead Group 2. They're going to show you how to do it. And then we're all doing it that night. And you know what? That night, three people got saved. That was amazing. But it was obedience-based discipleship. We're going to do this. And so moving on to level two of Timothy Initiative, only four of those initial nine went. And as we worked through uh, level two, only two of those people stayed. So nine went to two, and by all accounts, that was just failure. You did something that people couldn't keep up with. You, couldn't, you did something that people weren't able to do. But out in those two, those two, one of them is leading a 60-person um, youth group right now in Colorado. And the other person launched three micro churches and now has multiplied their discipleship uh, group to the fifth generation, which the Timothy Initiative would say is a movement. Preach, equip, plant, and repeat. Simplicity scales. Complexity crashes. We want to be simple in how we do it, but effective in making disciples here at Harvest Church for that end. And so my question to you is simply this. Do you want to be the two? Or do you want to be everybody else? Do you want to invest your life into something that's actually going to matter in eternity? Or do you want to invest your life in something that when you're dead and gone, nobody's going to care about? That's a question for you. That's a question for me. And there are things that we're going to do at Harvest Church that other churches don't do, and we're not going to do some things that other churches do because I want to be very intentional about what we're for, what we're about. We're here to create an army, not an audience. We're in our community for our community. We believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and we're going to share that message to everybody. We want to be a church that is absolutely on mission. Preach, equip, Plant and repeat. It's as simple as noodles, butter, and cheese. And it's just as good as it too. I'm thankful for 1027. I'm thankful for Tim Wolf. I'm thankful for what he taught me. I'm thankful for what he showed me. I'm thankful for what I've learned. And as I've been reflecting back on this church planning experience, I look back and out of all the books I've read and people I've been around, I'm like, man, I learned more in three years under Pastor Tim 
than I learned in anybody. You know why? Because he brought me along for the ride and he challenged me in places I didn't want to be challenged and he pushed me in places that he didn't want to push and he made me wait on things that I felt like I was ready for. But you know what? He shaped and molded my heart and my philosophy of ministry and I've seen it work and it's awesome. So you want to be the two or you want to be like everybody else? We're here so that all people may know and grow with Jesus. I want you to do that as well. And so here, here's, the, here's the thing. As you're looking at these behaviors, what is the next step you need to take? Do you need to get saved? Do you need to have a conversation with somebody about that? Maybe it's a recommitment of your life. Maybe you need to talk to your life group leader or a Harvest Home leader about that. Get in touch with me so I can talk to you about that. Maybe it's the next step is baptism. We've got several folks that have received Christ in, in, our, in our church, and, and maybe the next step is to, take, is to bab, be baptized. Maybe some of you are out there and you're, you're sitting on the sidelines. And, and you, you like to come to church, you know, one out of five weeks. That's kind of a regular tender. But you're, you're not ready to make that next commitment. But you really want to grow with Jesus. Where are you serving? You don't have to serve four out of four weeks or five out of five weeks. Serve once. Serve in a couple of different areas. Find out what you really like, but take the step of serving. How many of you, maybe you're giving. Guys, you guys have been super generous. I mean, you guys have been unbelievably generous since we launched Harvest Church. And even before, although I would say we launched it back in April with our groups and all those things. But maybe you need to start giving. Maybe you need to trust God with 2%. Maybe you need to trust God with 5%. Maybe some of you need to trust God with 10%. Or maybe some of you have been trusting God with 10% and God's saying, no, you need to trust me with 12%. Maybe some of you need to get in a group and figure out harvest homes or invite someone that you know is not a part of a harvest home and say, come on. And maybe some of you are saying, you know what, I've done all that and I'm leading a group, but man, I, I need to take the next step. But that whole multiply thing is really, really scary because now I have the responsibility for myself and I also have the responsibility for others. But I believe that this is the spiritual mature place is to multiply. So as you're in your harvest home and, and you're thinking about this and, and you're looking at this, I want to just challenge you. What's the next step you need to take? And I'm going to challenge you to say, take a step of faith. And you know what? Put away your availability. Make some margin to follow Jesus in the next step. If you don't want to be accountable, put yourself underneath somebody's leadership and trust Jesus with, with your heart, with their heart, right? And applicability, maybe some of you just need, you've been reading, you've got the time, you're okay with accountability, but you just are like, man, I need to take the step and actually obey what I've been reading. What's the next step you need to take? We want to preach, we want to equip, we want to plant, and we want to repeat so that all people may know Jesus and grow with Him. God bless you.